speaking to Mahima Shrestha. So Mahima is sitting in Kathmandu, in, I think it's Kathmandu, well, it's in Nepal, she'll tell us in a minute. <laughs> so she's going to be talking to us about collaborative understandings bring solution. Interesting topic. So I met Mahima I think last year, um, we had a Skype chat a couple of times. She's a beautiful, beautiful soul. And I know she wears lots of hats. You can read her bio on the, on the website. She wears lots of hats as far as I can tell. You know, she works with leaders. She works in aviation, finance, tourism, education. And I know she travels extensively for her work and she runs retreats in Nepal too. So Mahima. Lovely, Hi. lovely to have you with us today. Really excited to have you here. Um, so, thank you first of all. Are you in Kathmandu? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. I thought you were. <laughs> Just, as I said it, for some reason I disliked out. I know, I know it's Nepal. And you, how do you say it? You say it, is it Nepal? You say Nepal. Nepal, yes. Nepal, that's it. Yes. Nepal. You get the accent. Nepal. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so cool. Thank you for being with us today. Really cool. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. I was a huge fan of the summit last year. Good, good. Um, well, I can see we've got 49 participants with us so far listening and watching, so that's really good. And the place that I like to start with everybody, just to get a sense and get that connection going, is to find out a little bit about your journey. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, a little bit about you and the work that you're doing and how, you know, how it is that you're speaking on, on webinars and telling so much like this. Okay, okay. So, um, like you said, I live in Nepal. Um, I work here and in a few other parts of the world. Um, I guess how I got here, this, the simple answer would be that it, it makes sense now when I look back, but going forward, it wasn't really a neat trajectory. I started my career in journalism, then a lot of time in PR, so media and PR was my main background. Um, and somehow from that got more into crisis communications, media handling. Um, and there I encountered this thing, which in crisis we just call human factors in crisis, right? Which it seems obvious, but it, it really hadn't occurred to me that such a thing was possible, that we train people, we do all of these drills. And I mean, the guy can repeat them in his sleep. And still, on the day that something terrible happens, under pressure, some people sometimes will do the dumbest things. And I just couldn't understand that. And it wasn't for lack of information, because then two days later, I might ask him, well, what what would you have done if something like this happened? He knows what he should have done. So he has the answers, the information, but is somehow unable to access that. And so I got very curious that it was possible for something to happen in the mind of a human being that either made it so we are able to bring to bear the full extent of our resources, or we're unable to access even the simplest common sense things. So that's kind of how I got into this whole domain of humans and human beings and how do we work? Because you see, I could see that I have some version of that too, that in crisis, it's very stark and very visible, but I do have information and things I keep saying, oh, that would be good to do, or, oh, I, I really don't like that I take that personally or, you know, but somehow having the information of that doesn't help me see that differently. It doesn't help me change that. doesn't help me understand it differently. Um, and so I had a version of that too. And as far as I could see, every person has that. And so I got very curious about what that is that, that affects how we show up in the world, that affects how we see and understand the world. So that was my introduction to this, field that this whole tele summit is built on um yeah is that is that a good enough introduction <laughs> <laughs> yeah <clears throat> thank you it, it, it is well we're going to explore a bit further and we'll find out more about you and the work that you do um i remember i think <clears throat> correct me if i'm wrong but i i remember and i can't remember how long ago it was probably two years ago when um the earthquake there in nepal yes 2015 you, you, you got in touch with Rudy and Jenna, Rudy yes. and Jenny Kennard yeah. at the time. Yeah, yeah. And they, they went out um, to Nepal to do yes. some 
yes. and workshops and things with people. Can you just, you know, because obviously that we're talking about the understanding of the three principles and how they you came across that and, and they went out there and worked with you. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's really interesting. Sure, sure. So it's definitely a crisis. We, <laughs> yes, yes, definitely yeah. a crisis. Um, but I mean, for me, that was my first taste of what what we would call insight. Um, so the way that that happened for me was that I had just started to look um, and come across the three principles. I had come across Rudy and Jenny's website, Three Principles Movies, and I'd started to kind of browse there, just the very casual way we browse stuff online and we, you're just kind of skimming. So that was kind of my extent of involvement or understanding with the principles. I'd watched like a handful of videos. Um, and then we had the big earthquake here in April of 2015. And I remember um, standing outside or at my porch and watching kind of the whole house go like that. Um, and I think it takes me longer to explain this than, than when it actually happened, mm. but I'm, I'm going to try. Okay. So here's, here's the way that happened. So first of all, standing out there, I, okay, I'm going to try not to curse. Very afraid. Okay. Uh, <laughs> very scared. Um, just unprecedented in the scale of damage um, that certainly in my lifetime, but probably also in my parents' lifetime, we had just never seen that extent of destruction and damage. Um, so standing outside, looking at my house, really, really afraid. And then just this curious idea or, or question of, well, is, is that really possible that what I'm feeling right now is unrelated to the earthquake? Is it possible that I'm really just manufacturing that in a way um, and that it's independent, meaning that at this moment, I could feel the most afraid I have ever been. But equally, is it possible that I could feel as safe as I ever have? Because the feeling and the the outside, there is no direct link between them. Um, and somehow in just having just a curiosity about that, a few seconds later, I was not afraid anymore. And it was hard to explain that. It, I couldn't articulate, well, what's the big deal? Like, I considered a new possibility. Um, and it hadn't occurred to me that there was such a fundamental relationship between seeing something differently and literally being different a few seconds later. I just hadn't, it had never occurred to me like that. And I mean, even now when I say it, it sounds smaller than it was, but to be terrified one moment and not to be the next without anything having changed on the outside was radical. Mm. So it was after that that I emailed um, Rudy and Jenny and I emailed them to say thank you very much for all of all that they've made available on the movie site because it was also a great resource for many of us here at the time. Um, and that was all really that I'd just written to say thanks because even, even then there wasn't very much public content available um, in a comprehensive, as comprehensive a way as it was on the Three Principles movie site. So I wrote to them and then Jenny wrote me back. She was actually on the way to the Three Principles conference in London, the Innate Health Conference. Um, and she said, well, would it be helpful if we came? Because we would be happy to come and um, do some work there. Um, so it was through that, that email exchange, really, that she um, came over here with Rudy and um, Dave Ellery, the three of them had come over um, and they worked with a whole, a very diverse range of people from people in a community hospital to um, school children. So they, they worked with a very diverse group here and I could see, I don't know, I could see in a way that resilience was natural and that if you pointed people to it, there was a way that it could be freed up in them. Mm. Um, that if we saw that we were essentially putting a, 
a lid on this kind of just innate resilience within people. Um, and the lid was, was made up of thought. If we could see that, then somehow it, it created a more generative possibility within people. So that was kind of my first real in-person taste of that. Mm. Like, I, I understand what you, what you say when it's, in words it sounds really small, that, 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 that shift that you, t- you were talking about when you were standing outside and the earthquake quake was happening. And, you, and then we say it in words and it sounds like, well, okay, and? <laughs> <You> know, and? <laughs> yes. Is it, is, it really as simple as, is it really as simple as that? And I think that's why it gets overlooked so much. Yes, yes. Inside out understanding of the, mm. the, the way it really works. True. Yes. So now, now having, you know, so that was back in April 2015, you said. Yeah. So, yeah. so over, since then, I know you've been doing some great work. You've put together programs. You've been working with people in, crisis, in the crisis management area mm-hmm. and um, young women as well, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Would, would so you maybe, talk to us? Maybe I'll little, tell you a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I work with a very diverse range of people, um, social entrepreneurs, um, women, youth, um, CEOs. So across um, many different socioeconomic groups. Um, and usually they are longish term programs in that they are usually somewhere between six to nine months. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of them are on leadership, some are resilient, some are think tanks. Uh, so the, the scope of work is very broad, but here's what's in common in all of them, right? The central premise for all of my work on this front at the moment is, the, is this, I guess, realization for me that there is, as a world, um, we think that problems and issues and systems and cultures somehow exist independent of the people in it. Right? So there is a way that we'll say, well, the organizational culture is really bad. Or we might say, as with government, we might say, well, the system is that way. Right? So we somehow have a way of not recognizing that systems do not exist independent of the people in them, that we are co-creators of the system. At every moment, we're co-creators of the system. And it doesn't really exist independent of the people in it, right? So this whole dimension of the people side, um, in my work, I tend to call it the human infrastructure, right? Which is very simply, to me, the quality of mental performance and relationships between people, um, between people in a team, in a community, in a, in a problem or um, a stalemate, right? So the quality of mental performance and relationships between people. For me, that kind of is a way of talking about this. And that, like, I know that some of my friends who do use dialogue a lot and mediation, they call it an invisible architecture between people, right? That somehow it's invisible to us. We don't see that there is this dimension at work shaping the way that we shaping the systems we create, the cultures we create, the way that we hold issues stuck, we don't realize that we are participants, we are co-creators of that. Um, And that's really where all of my work is, which is in helping to first make that visible, to make this whole kind of lifeblood of this system visible. Um, And then to kind of reflect and experiment for ourselves and start to learn a little bit about the inner workings of this system. Um, And the results of that is that every single community, person, team, group that I work with finds the solutions they need. That uh, contrary to what we might think, which is, well, if they knew the solution, why are they still in such a mess? The truth is that a mind in distress is not capable of finding the best solutions for itself. But equally, the mind that creates the problem is the one that the solution, the sustainable solution, will come from. And so the bulk of my work is more as a facilitator or a mentor, just to facilitate that process within people um does that help to 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, thank you. I think we're beginning. <laughs> you know, I can ask you a few more questions about it because I think, you know, we're talking about the, the worldwide work, if, if work in communities, um, how that happens. So, so I think I'm curious for, for people listening is how, how do you get in, you know, it's a how-to question, I know. How do you, it's where the mind goes, isn't it? How do you, how do you sort of get into working with people like that? I suppose is it is it something that you're already doing and then and you've kind of enhanced it enhanced it with the principal's work or is it is it new work coming your way is it people asking you just just curious just for people because what we want to do as well on this telly summit I think is inspire people to what's possible mm. we really want to inspire people that you know it's not it's possible for anybody to be to be part of a community obviously and then be working in that community and helping people Mm-hmm. Well, that's a very good question. No, this was not my line of, <laughs> line of work before. Very far from it. Um, this is not, yeah, it was just not in my world until maybe two years ago. Um, but the way that most of these projects came about is mostly through conversation. So there was a leadership one I did with young women. Um, and that came about simply because in Nepal, the year of the earthquake, actually, we had about six months of political cat fighting between Nepal and India. Um, and so they shut down the borders. There was a huge humanitarian crisis here. And I was in conversation with a friend and a colleague. She runs this nonprofit, um, which they, their main work is that they are grooming young women to be leaders in their industries. Um, and somehow in, in conversation, I said to her, well, it seems to me like we give our girls the external skills of leadership, right? We'll teach them how to do a media baseline study. We'll teach them how to speak well, how to do critical thinking. We teach them, you know, all the external skills of leadership, but we don't really give them internal skills so that all they need is to join an NGO and meet one corrupt guy um, be told off, be rejected a couple of times, and then they're they're jaded and done. Because it's you get in with all of this idealism and goodwill, you know, of wanting mm-hmm. to be a service. Of, and then you, you're you somehow unprepared for the knocks of that or the realities of that. And I think that's a fundamental gap that we actually, we don't teach people that we're we're built for reality. What we're not built for is conjecture and making stuff up and worrying about them and then trying to figure our way out of that. We're built for reality to see whatever it might be with clarity and have insight to move forward on it. And it was just to me such a huge missing piece that I felt, well, we're kind of sending them one legged into the race. Um, it, It doesn't seem complete or fair or useful um, to not have that kind of internal education. And so from that conversation came a nine month program with the alumni from that, from their last batch, right? So mostly for me, they've come out of conversation. So even when it is in corporate, it has been a conversation where I'm always curious about people, you know, like when I meet people, I'm always like, what do you guys talk about? Like, what do you think about? And I'm always curious about different industries. And um, yeah, almost all of my projects, um, none of them have come about for me from a formal pitch or, I mean, the pitch and things have been later once there was already a connection and a conversation and an opportunity to learn something from them about their world. Um, Mm. Then at some point there was an invitation to do something. Um, And I think one of the things I've learned about that is to recognize, I guess, the way that I work best. So usually for me, it means before I do a pitch, before I do anything, I want to meet at least five or six members of the team that I will be working with. Um, And it will be part intake, part, um, I don't know, just like like an introductory coaching session might be. Um, 
and from there usually there are clear outcomes that they need there's oh okay so this is a better way to do it this this should be more like a think tank this should be more like an executive coaching program so for me those things tend to come out of direct interactions with them mm. rather than a pre preset plan mm. that's that's interesting so you don't have it's not like you're going out looking for this particularly that's what i've heard you say it's like Mm. casual conversations with people and I, I love that you're curious I heard um I mean it, 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 so you're doing it in coaching and training and mm. training programs coaching and do you do you have your own business is that yes you, so yeah. I mean I guess the reason that I'm not usually looking for principles related business is because my main work is still communications right just um to get that so, mm. yes Yes, so the principles programs are, I mean, they're an increasingly <clears throat> growing size of my portfolio, but they're, they're not my main um, business. Yeah, I get that. So you're meeting pe different people all the time. Yes. So I guess what I want to move to is, is the, um, the title of this session, Collaborative. I've forgotten it already. Collaborative understandings bring solutions. There you go. Good job. I've got notes, isn't it? Collaborative understandings <laughs> yes. bring solutions. So, what does what does that what does what, what would you just speak to that a little bit? What does that mean? Well, for me, I think the first thing that this highlights for me is the kind of collaborative. For me, has been a very. It has been a very. I don't know. I guess it. It's been more of a learning for me on that, that how much learning takes place in simple human conversations. Um, and to see that, like when I do groups, right, I'll, I'll often ask them, like at some point in the program, they get to pick whether they want more one-on-ones, whether they want more pairs, whether they want more group work. Um, and almost invariably, they'll say to me, group. Group. Whereas at the beginning of programs, often these are people who might be hostile towards each other, particularly in corporate or communities. They can be people who don't actually want to hang out at all. Um, and so there's usually at the beginning a lot more time in pairs or one-on-ones and, and very little interaction in the big groups. And at some point in the program, the whole group starts to be collaborative in their learning, that they recognize there is an inherent equality between people um, and also an inherent neutrality between us, that regardless of what I think of you and you think what you think of me, there is still a common ground between people. Um, and most of them at the end of the programs will say, when I ask them, what did you like best? They say group sessions. There was so much to learn from each other. And so for me, the title, the collaborative understanding brings solution. It really points me to where solutions come from. People who can think clearly together and who can take collective action with clarity and goodwill towards each other. That's at the heart of transformation. And certainly if you look at transformative communities, that's at the heart of it. People just being able to see each other and for some of our baggage about each other to drop away so we can start to interact from a new foundation. Hmm. Without that, no change really can take place in any setting because I mean, where are you alone, right? We have families, we have communities, we have colleagues, we have clients. All of that involves people. Hmm. I was just thinking that actually when you were talking. I mean, that's when we have to think about the community of family, how yes. it's, it's helpful. Imagine when you're doing the training, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. They're from if the, they've got some family somewhere that they have to interact yes. with. So you take that home and, uh, and it makes communication much easier. Yes. An yes. understanding of how this, this, this thing called life works, really. Yes. Uh, just want to go back to a point that you made. You said people can be hostile. Mm -hmm. Let's that word down. <laughs> hostile. And then something happens during the trainings. And so I would like you to just explain a little bit about what happens during the trainings for those people. Okay. Okay. So 
The basic thing is, the way that it usually happens is that right at the beginning, I'll say, okay, like, tell me about you guys. Where are you? What's going on? What's working well? What sucks? Like, what's going on? Right? And then they get done telling me and then usually some version of this happens where I say, well, thank you for sharing. Now forget about that for the next three days. Okay, because what we're going to do is actually look in the opposite direction for a while. We'll come back to those. But for the next three days, look this way, right? And all I'm going to do is give you some flags, okay? So you can start to see how this human system is working in you, not in anybody else, in you, right? That's all we want them to see at the beginning. That's all. Then I... And it turns out that I don't then have to tell people, oh, this is how to work with each other. Oh, this is how to disagree in a constructive way. Oh, this is how to handle anger. No, I don't have to tell people that. If people understand the source of their discomfort, distress, anger, they figure out what they want to do with that. Right? People don't suffer voluntarily. Usually when we have a habit, whether that's that I'm quick to anger or I'm very anxious, I don't know another way out. That's why I do that. And if I understood that and I start to have insight just the way I did standing outside my house, then they'll figure out, it's inevitable that they'll figure out a different way to be because life will look different to them. The same people that they had disagreements with will look different to them. They'll understand each other better, almost despite themselves. Mm -hmm. Because that's the deal. Once they start to understand themselves better, they, in a way, can't even control what that does. Because y your, your eyeballs get so different. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you look out, you see the people and the world and the problems differently. You can't, you can't help it. Mm. It's kind of, I don't know, in some ways, these kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? That we're, we're talking about collaborative solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what they were talking about. Collaborative understandings to bring solutions. Yeah, so yeah. that's like, like working together. And the, the way that I've heard you just talk about is, is the way that you do it is by asking them to put, look inside, looking towards themselves versus out there yes yeah. well i mean the thing is i think Starting it's point is, artificial i think it's an artificial differentiator to say start with the individual versus the group because actually with people a group is is kind of like an ecosystem um they are like or like cells in a body i mean they're in a way independent and in a way not and both are powered by this generative intelligence behind all of life. So in a way, every distinction is artificial anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's all made up at the end of the day, isn't it? <laughs> problems, solutions. So people can see that they're, they're, they're creating their own problems, I imagine, on some level by the time they finish working with you. You can see, well, is there, was there even a problem there in the first place? I hear, I hear that all the time that people walk away and say, well, couples have relationship counseling that are pointed within and then they say what problem <laughs> wasn't a problem well also i mean i think it we can get blinded by our habitual version of the problem so that we actually we get blinded to the actual issues that are there because it's very likely that there are things that need to be solved um, but I'm unlikely to see that clearly if I'm so possessive about my current view on this. Mm. You are too, and he is too. So then we are unlikely to see that because like I'll give you an example of management teams, right? Often when I start working with them, I say, well, what's the problem? There's a laundry list of problems, right? And in this one particular instance, it did really seem like they had big structural challenges. And they were, I mean, it needed workflow management. It needed, I mean, it needed a lot of work, which was not my expertise. They needed a proper, like, renovation job, right? But then at the end of 
four, yeah, at the end of four months of this program, one of the days we were having this group session and one of the leaders said to me, well, you know what? I think I've realized we really only have one problem, which is the six of us around this table, they were all heads of departments. We don't know how to talk to each other. We don't know how to disagree respectfully. We don't know how to think together. We're each stuck in our own corner, defending our own turf, right? So, and they could see that if that changed, like that they have had, you know, that laundry list of problems, mm -hmm. those situations have happened many, many times. And of those many times, there have been a handful of times when somehow they got resolved as though it was nothing. It was like, oh yeah, I just made a phone call to him and said like, hey, how about we try it this way? Um, but you can see that simple things can be made difficult if people are agitated, hostile, and there is a loss of goodwill between people, right? So there was, there was a need for them to have a shift in the way that they approached each other and understood each other. And, a, and they at some point realized for themselves that they're, we're on the same team. Now it should have been obvious, right? Mm. But it wasn't, and it often isn't to us either. Um, Too true. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> as humanity yeah <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah we, you know it's pretty obvious we're all human beings but we don't appear to actually mm -hmm. look like to, to be working in unison and being on the same team I mean it's, yes yes microcosm up to the macro yeah it's, it's mm -hmm. I'm just gonna have a look I've got a um, an anonymous uh, 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 um, comments I think so surely so somebody's saying here surely it, it is the scared feeling of externals in brackets earthquakes that keeps us safe scared feeling of that keeps us safe if earthquakes did not make me feel scared I might just say it's only thought and so stand there and let the building fall on me rather than run away I may be scared but I get to live another day I think it's a question as much as a Mm -hmm. it's a question mark and so I have, I have something to say to that because I yeah. um, so I'm just going to recount a couple of things from there okay and um, I guess ask the, the person to kind of just reflect on that um, because a couple of different things happened so one of those was that there is I had the same idea that you know if, if I feel fear then I'm going to be cautious. I'm going to protect myself. But here's, here's one of the things that happened. There were days when I could be so afraid that I wasn't fully functional. I had other family members with me. I could barely think for them. I was just like, they, like they couldn't move out of my sight without me getting completely anxious about them. Now my anxiety didn't help them be any safer. Um, but there was that, overwhelming feeling of anxiety, right? Um, and one of the things that that did for me, the days when I was that afraid, couldn't sleep well. Um, now the, the earthquake for us was many weeks, right? Because it was like one earthquake and then aftershocks, huge aftershocks for weeks and weeks. So I could see that if I then continued this pattern of being so afraid I couldn't think clearly. I couldn't sleep well. I was kind of just at the edge with people around me. I was not, um, I couldn't think about kindness or other people or anything. And I couldn't distinguish what was a rational, reasonable precaution and what was completely unrelated, but just uh, like just because I was scared and I felt I needed to do something. So I started to see that there was actually a decline in my functionality that I couldn't clearly distinguish between just stress talk um, and useful precautions, right? Um, and to contrast that, there were, there were many, many days when I was calmer, much calmer. And here's what I noticed about those times, that I didn't get stupid all of a sudden, right? I could see that 
there was a way in which I was able to access more of my intelligence. Not that I got smarter either, um, but I was able to access more of my intelligence. I could see clearly. I could talk to my five-year-old, well, she was then three, niece more gently so that she actually doesn't have to panic just because I'm panicking, right? Um, I could see useful things like, oh yeah, I should probably take the battery pack and keep one outside just in case. Um, now, in all these three days, I hadn't done that, um, but it was a useful thing to do. Um, it just hadn't occurred to me. Um, I slept well. I was rested during the day. If people needed help, I could actually see because I realized there were days when I was, or moments when I was blinded by by fear. Um, it didn't make me safer, but it did make me just, yeah, I mean, in a way, blinded is the only way I can think to explain that contrast that I noticed in myself, that I, my vision was less clear. My thinking was less clear. I was more tired and edgy and um, actually unhelpful to be around. Hmm. Hmm. So I hope that answers that for whoever came in. Okay. Um, so somebody else has written into us. Okay, so I'm just going to read it out. I'm a follower of the three principles for many years, and I have a strong understanding which followed from my insight. As she's, whoever it is says, I haven't listened to the Tony conference, the Tony summit before, but they're surprised that we complicate the way we explain the principles to people. Your guest speaker tries to explain something, but I can't feel what she's talking about. Sydney Banks, we're going to be talking about, pass on things simple and fundamentally true, but we're making it sound so complicated for the last... 30 minutes, I haven't heard anything related to the principles. So there you go, I'm just being honest and reading out what's there, and we could hide sure. it, but there's no point in doing that. So what, what would you like to respond to, to that? Well, I guess I'll respond with what has been my learning on this. Mm -hmm. um, one of which is the inherent limitation of language. Absolutely. <laughs> that you see something simply and because other people can't see the inside of your head, you then have to find some way to language that, right? So one of that, one of those elements is, is that language inherently is, is a kind of difficult medium through which to transmit something simple. The other thing is, I think to me, the principles are a very, it's a conversation where we each can only ever share glimpses that we see. None of us on this call or none of the other teachers, she sees the whole thing at one go. We each get glimpses of, or slivers of understanding um, and that's all really that we can share. Um, so yeah, I guess, um, that accounts for the huge differences in the way that people will teach and also for why we'll resonate with different people at different times. Mm. And also, you know, the, the, the point of these calls isn't necessarily to teach the three principles, but it's to, to illustrate how, I mean, the, the whole, the whole point of this was to, to, to show how you know we're trying creating communities around the world, and you're in Nepal, and we you know we've we've asked people people have nominate been nominated, and then the centre have looked at people and tried to pick people that are around the world, and obviously you're you, I'm in Spain, you're in Nepal, we're talking to you there. Yeah. But it's curious to see what people are doing around the world and how that's happening, mm -hmm. and how we you know how people are are reaching out and, and speak as you've just said, you know we can only share from what we see. So I imagine, you know, Sid, I know that Sid said that, you, you, when you've seen something fresh, talk to people about it, or keep it for yourself, or just, just talk, talk to people about what you've seen, but only what you've seen, not what somebody else has told you, unless, yes. you know, you have your insight, you share that, and that, that's, the, that's what I've been doing, and that's what I've, I was trained to do, if you like, it was advice to do, but you've just got to go back and listen to Sid, that's what he said. Um, 
So that's my two pennies on, on that. I suppose that, that that's the point of the tele summit is to show show how people are transforming, creating these transformative communities around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and you're doing a lot of work by the sounds of it, a lot with different types of people. So maybe we'll explore that a little bit more. Um, just see so some other questions popped in. Here we go. Somebody saying another anonymous one, another perspective from somebody else me in brackets mm -hmm. i find your description of the principles in your life incredibly accessible and inspiring so thank you a reminder yeah that we all have separate realities absolutely yeah. which is what you said isn't it we're yeah. living the same things in different ways so it's different different what do you say different horses for courses or something like that in english we say so yeah let's let's explore a little bit more about the work that you're you know you're doing over there in nepal and um, yeah what, what else can we can we talk about that, that's happening out there for you? Well, actually, um, maybe just something I wanted to add, um, just because the theme is creating transformative communities worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, and many of us at this stage are um, wondering, we're in conversation with people about communities and collective action. Um, whether at a large scale or a very small scale, right? So it seems a conversation that's kind of growing larger here. Um, and by here, I mean, like, everywhere. Uh, Romania, I have friends in Romania who are like, there's this sudden kind of increase in conversation about what, what, what can an individual do? Um, and it's a drop in the ocean, no matter what I do. So what's the deal? What, what, what's a person to do? Right. So this is a conversation, I guess, it's also very relevant to me because I'm always wondering um, about social change and our, our part in it as individuals. Um, and as you mentioned, I was part of the first One Solution conference in Oslo. I'm also doing collaborations with them. So this conversation around social change or, or individual sparking change, I just wanted to add something about that, which is based on learnings from projects I'm doing, um, whether that's in businesses or communities or with social entrepreneurs. One of the things I've realized is that people are starting to see, to get a glimpse of the inner workings, right? The inner mechanisms at work through which they create their experience of life. Hmm. Right? that to, to see that for the very first time, and then to see it collectively as a team or a community, it changes the foundation from which people operate. And in a way, it changes the foundation of people's potential to innovate and to affect change, right? So there's something very non-linear about that relationship where on one hand, yes, I'm one person, um, out of how many ever million in this country. Um, and yet, one person starting to see something differently has this kind of ripple effect on, on the systems that she lives and works in. And the impact of that has been, has been to me, mind-blowing. Like, there, there would be um, girls that I would work with who, uh, one of them, for example, was completely, completely, completely um, afraid to a very extreme extent of the situation in her family. Now, it wasn't violent in the, or aggressive in, in the ways that we would think, but it was very tense. The relationship between them was very tense. Uh, Short-tempered, lots of baggage of disagreements in the family, that kind of thing, okay? Um, and we're working, um, and she just started a social enterprise. And so that's the capacity in which we're working. And then one day she comes and she says, well, something very strange happened to me this weekend. So I was at home with my parents. I had visitors from my father's family. And normally when they visit, it's always loud and there's things being flung and breaking and it's just very, very unpleasant. And somehow this last weekend they came over 
And when I heard they were coming over, I said to my parents, I think I need to talk to you. And she, it turns out, sat them down for two hours and told them, I don't know what, right? But then the next thing she realizes is that, well, that whole day has gone. And they have just had an amazing, pleasant family time for the very first time in years, years. Now, it's in a way irrelevant, the exact content that she said to them. But somehow, she sensed an opportunity to start a new conversation. Her parents sensed an opportunity, a hope that things could be different. It's not like they wanted things to be unpleasant, right? But somehow, in her invitation, there was this opening for them to see, well, yeah, maybe things could be different. Things could be different between us. Mm. Um, and in a way, it was such a simple, non-dramatic act, right? It was dramatic to her because she couldn't ask him to, to go out for an evening. And then she sat them down for two hours. But it was such a simple human act. It wasn't dramatic, but the impact was so potent. Um, um, and it has completely changed the trajectory of their interaction with each other. I love that. I love that. We talked a little bit yesterday on the first call about ripples. because, mm. and, and this is, when people say this is not getting out there fast enough, people are not catching on quick enough. It is really one heart at a time. I mean, it's one person. You know, we talked about that at the beginning, where you, you meant, talked about you know, human infrastructure, you know, systems, infrastructure, we're made, you know, people are people and communities made of people and it's one heart at a time. And that, but that ripple effect is, I think it's much more powerful than we realise. We, yes. we don't, we don't really don't know. We think we know. We've got mm. people in a room or we're talking to somebody and we see, oh, there's not, you know, people haven't been touched or moved or impacted, whichever word suits you. But you don't, we don't know. You really don't know. You know, it could be an hour later, a day later, 10, 10 hours later, 10 days, 10 years later even. Just think it's um, an unknowable quantity, isn't it? It's, it's, we just don't know. So talking about that girl then that, that you've just mentioned, do, is there, have there been any, talking about the ripple effect as well and how, how it's spreading in community, have any other people started sharing that you know of because obviously there's stuff we just can't know about well as far as i know um there are people so within the organizations or or groups that we have worked with before within the context of their organization i know that there are people who are sharing that with new people or other members of their team who weren't on these trainings um, but i don't know if there are other facilitators um, doing this. Mm. I was just curious because, you know, that sometimes, well, a lot of times people get really inspired, don't they? They hear something yes. for themselves, it changes their lives, just like you. Um, yes. they, and they decide they want to, to go out and start talking to people about this and helping people yes. to see. And they, they might well have because there is... Yeah, um, I know about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if people hadn't asked me to, to tell them what I was doing, um, you wouldn't really know because my, my main work is media. Um, so there might, it's very possible that there might be people um, sharing who just are not as, maybe as publicly uh, visible at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I suppose I kind of want to ask you what inspired you to start sharing? <laughs> well, actually what inspired me was I don't know whether it was inspiration or, or very persistent nudges, um, but um, Jenny, uh, Jenny and Rudy, oh, yeah. um, that is how, yeah, because they're they're very stealth in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stealth stealthy, right? Sure. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Under, undercover. <laughs> yes, and very very, they're very gentle and and very persistent. Yes. Yeah. You can do this, Mahima. You can do this. You can do yes. this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or hey, why don't you join us? And then you join them in the audience and they're like, Hey, I was thinking after lunch. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you yeah, yeah. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> the bulk of the credit for that is uh, definitely theirs. Hmm. So, so uh, if you were to to um, to speak to somebody who who wanted to do the type of work that you're doing, it's like so, you know, if you do crisis management, let's talk about that because that's the you know this that's a tough. It looks like it's the tough stuff. What what advice would you give them? For people who wanted to do, want to share the principles, the three principles, you want to share the inside out understanding. That, that what would you, what advice would you give them wanting to start up a group? You know, and I've heard you say that groups seem to be the most popular. Well, I don't know because honestly, for me, the the nudge seems to be always to. You know, we, we have this word, we say grounding, which yeah. we take to broadly mean the depth or the way in which I understand something, right? Um, and actually, I was speaking to uh, somebody just last week to say, I do feel like it's time for me to actually take some time off from some of the teaching engagements and spend a bit more time, you know, just for me, learning for me. Um, so that's one piece, the, the, the selfish side of this, that I mean, be a beneficiary, you know? So that, that's one piece that I, I want to kind of remind anybody who's wanting to share this. Um, the second is, I think we have very narrow predefined ideas of who I could work with um, mm. you know like oh I could work with businesses or oh I could work with school teachers or but the thing is there's people everywhere we look um, and we don't actually know where there is openness for this kind of understanding because I find that it's it's rich to reach people at a time when they are just, they're ripe for it. They're wondering like, really, is this all there is? Is there, is there a better way to do this? Is there a better way to be together? Is there, so there's always phases when people are kind of wondering about that. Um, and you don't really know whether that's a school teacher or that's a housewife or a teenager or a mom with teenage kids or a CEO. I think it's been for me most helpful to not have an idea of who specifically, but to start talking to people, start seeking conversations with people um, and trying to see what does like get on their side of the wall and see like, what does their world look like? Um, because anytime that's the other thing, pushback, people often ask me about, do you get a lot of resistance or pushback? Um, so there's usually I get, I get it at two different stages. Okay. So usually at the first stage, whenever I have gotten pushback, I realize it's because I've stopped listening. It's because I have somehow forgotten that, no, no, they know the inside of their world. Right. And it's a perfectly valid version, just like mine. That's how they see things right now. And there is no way that somebody can come at you and say, well, the way you're seeing it is flawed. And if you saw it this way, like my way, you would be better off. There is no version of that that people enjoy. And there is no version of that that prompts openness in people. Um, and so that has been, and, and I mean, embarrassed to say it's not a lesson I have fully learned because I keep, I keep catching myself there of kind of getting so caught up in that and then at some point realizing that and pulling back. Um, so that's, that's, for me, it has been a really important lesson um, of listening. And in a way, for me, marketing with the principles is really just listening. Because as I speak to people and I ask them a couple of questions, they tell me about how things are, what they're interested in, what they're struggling with, somewhere in that is an opening for me. 
And my best bet of seeing that is if I'm not already sold on my pitch or my story mm -hmm. about them, mm -hmm. then I'm free to hear them and I'm free to accept an opening that they'll give me. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love what they just said there. I mean, the listening piece is so overlooked and uh, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's just so overlooked because people tend not to listen. We're just so busy. Yes. We've got our own agenda. And I really like what you said just then as well. When I'm, I'm willing to let go of, I heard the word agenda. You probably didn't say that. When, <laughs> my goals, my, you know, what I want to happen. When I'm willing to let go of that and listen, mm -hmm. then you're going to hear something fresh, something new. And like you say already, I think you said that, um, there's a, there's a way in if you like if we need a way in there's a way, there is a way in there's always not a very nice way of saying it but there's a, there's a connection isn't it it's always a, it's yes. about the, the way to connect with people and if we listen that's that's the starting piece for sure yes. because i think i mean the th the thing is i don't think we realize how slippery this like thought created reality ah. is i, mean, I know mm -hmm. we do this all day long but really we're fooled by it all the time, all the time. And we forget how potent it is. So then when we are in it, it's like, no, but it is true. I am really right here. Like <laughs> if you thought this differently, they would be better off. Yeah. You know, and we kind of get sold on our story and we forget that we are also the same human system at work. And we're not somehow immune to or exempt from being fooled by our own thinking yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that is so true isn't it, it really is mm -hmm. um well I, we haven't got any more questions come in and i'm looking at the time we you know we don't have to go on and on. i mean do you have anything else that you would like to add i i feel like we're complete from my, from my point of view but up to you. Again, that's my separate reality you <laughs> Okay, well, I guess I'd just like to let everybody listening know that if they do have a question, um, we'd love to answer anything that, because there's a lot of open threads that I could talk about for another two or three minutes, but I would really just love to hear, where are you guys with this? I've just got a question coming, so shall I read it out to you? That's interesting. Yeah. As I said, no more no questions, the questions come in. Anonymously. Um, so, is it that the scared that keeps us safe is fully experienced, acted on in the moment, and then allowed to pass? While the scared that persists and disrupts everyday life has not been fully felt, so it persists in an attempt to get our attention. Once it is fully felt, acknowledged, it will go away on its own. Okay, so I'm just going to share my understanding of this, not fact. Mm -hmm. um, just my experience of it, okay? okay? So for me, one of the things that has been helpful is to not try to dissect thoughts or feelings into, oh, is this piece different from that piece? Is this kind of fear different from that kind of fear? Now, it it might well be that there is a physical kind of visceral aspect of fear. Uh, but the truth is I will experience all fear through thought. That's so for me, it has always been helpful to look more to how the system works, regardless of what it is I'm feeling. The truth is the only way that I will ever experience that is through thought, right? So it has been helpful to me to try and understand the nature of that, um, to understand that more deeply. And it has been for me less helpful to look at individual content, right? Of, um, and so that's just, that's, my my take on this that it has been helpful to see the whole and the way the system is at work here that i feel my thinking 100 percent of the time right 
And that's the only way I feel anything. And that when I recognize that, somehow there is a way in which I become able to access greater intelligence. I become able to think beyond my very narrow, nervous version of life and version of the world. That somehow there is opportunity for me to see life afresh and in doing that, have an increased capacity to handle whatever it is I'm facing. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. So thank you. Thank you for that. I th and, and before that, you asked something about what are you guys up to. I, I guess you mean Centre for Sustainable Change, do you, when you said that? Yes. Yeah. Well, I can't speak for them 100% because I'm not part of the organisation. But... Um, shared about the one solution and they've, they've got lots of things going on I want to share um, their website center for sustainable change.org mm -hmm. that's for sure there's tons going on there we've got a course um, with West Virginia University as far as I remember with Judy Sedgman who is coming up next with Dave mm -hmm. may you talk a little bit about that so thanks for asking there's, mm -hmm. lots, there's lots there and actually I want to just as I wrap up because it's time for me to start wrapping up um, if people want to get in touch with you, Mahima, how can they do that? Um, the best place to get in touch is probably on the website. Um, so I'll give you, actually, I think, yes, that's where it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Scarlett. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there you go. We've got your, got your slide up from, uh, from Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte, behind the scenes. She's a wonder woman there behind the scenes. Okay.